Lebanon. We'd like to thank Ambassadors for Christ for the musical selection of the Shepherd song. I would also like to thank Keenan for introducing me as a speaker. I'd like to thank my sister for introducing me. I love her very much, so. A little girl was typing away on her father's computer. She told him she was writing a story. He said, what's it about? She replied, I don't know. I can't read. <laughs> Let us pray. Lord, touch our hearts. Open our Lord, touch our tongues, open our hearts, bless your people, amen. amen. Just a few days ago, we were all in the spirit wishing everyone a happy new year. Today we stand with 296 days ago. What have we accomplished so far? Many of us have set goals and New Year's resolutions. With only 69 days passed so far, how do we measure up? I would like to suggest something to us this new year. We are given a chance to look at what we have done in the past and to make changes for the future. This is certainly to us. We look at worship in our churches. As we look to the future, I believe the church is called to make worship an exciting experience for love of God's love for all people of all ages. We especially need to reach out to the children to, to help them know that the story of God's love for each of us and, and to express the real, that relationship with God through worship. As the New Year offers us a fresh start, a chance to do things right, a chance to witness not only to the adults who haven't heard the good news of Christ, but also to the children. We have a new chance to tell the old, old story in a way that children can hear. Yeah. Hearing the story of people of God can help the children know where they fit in. It can give them hope when they make mistakes because God is forgiving God. Amen. After all, isn't there a story about a boy who did the wrong things but his father forgave him anyway? In this age so hostile kids, who will stand up and be the advocate? We claim to be Christians, but if we would follow Jesus, we must be advocates for the children because that is what he was. Through hearing the word of the Bible, children learn that Jesus considered them to be important people. Then the little children were brought to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought him. But Jesus said, Let the little children come unto me, and do not stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Those, those disciples weren't with them, the, mean, the other mean men in Gal, they simply reflected the way society saw and treated children. But not Jesus. He defended children. You can study the lives and teachings of the so-called leaders of this world. You can go back to the founders of world, world religions or to the figures that are revered or worshipped by millions. Buddha, Krishna, or Muhammad. Forget about the wise and profound sayings that they are supposed to have other. Forget about the miracles or amazing acts of heroism. Just look at one aspect, how they treated children. Then read the Gospels and think for a while about Jesus of Nazareth. You find a profound difference. For the so-called great people of history, kids hardly counted. They weren't important in themselves, but for what they may become. The goal of life was focused on adult behavior and attainment. For Buddha, it was to become enlightened and reach the cessation of all desires. For Hinduism, it is to accumulate so much good karma by our deeds that we can break the cycle of endless death and rebirth. But Jesus comes along and says, no, kids are important right now, as they are in themselves. The, the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Then what the, the good shepherd do? He takes them into his arms. Who will be an advocate for children today? Who will teach and guide them in the way to go? Who will speak for us? Who will defend us from those outside the church? or in it? Who will turn them away, crush them, or humiliate them? Jesus defended children, and so must we. It begins in our, 
in our homes, and in the great Lebanon church. Let's spend more time on our knees and in the Word, studying the life of Jesus and treat kids as he treated them, not as the world of TV treats us. Let this be a church where we feel safe and secure, where we are valued and defended. It's time we take seriously to the admission of the people of Israel in Deuteronomy. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are awake and when you lie down and when you rise. Does worship me in your church tell children that they are important? Do you find ways to make worship inviting to them? It's like the kindergarten teacher who told her kids on the first day of school. If you, if you have to go to the bathroom, just hold out two fingers. A little voice from the back of the room asks, how would that help? Do you have worship bulletins for children that explain what is happening? Do you provide bookmarks so they can locate and mark hymns early so they don't end up finding the hymns just when everyone else is, has finished singing? Do you, do you involve children in more than just children's story? Do children help greet? Do greeters acknowledge children as they come into the sanctuary? If you were to look at worship in our congregation through the eyes of a child, what would you see? How would you feel? When you do that, do you feel that this church is really a place for you? God has called us to a ministry with children. We always hear of adults who are discussing ways to improve the lives of children, to prevent the increase of domestic violence in children's homes, to educate children and help children make good choices in their lives. Many who read the sad stories in the newspaper today say that children are not being taught properly at home, that teachers aren't teaching properly at school, and that children do not show proper respect. While some of that is probably true, I think that as the church, we have a unique opportunity to change some of what we see. We may not reach every child, but we can make a difference in many children. We at the Children of Le Lebanon challenge you, our church members, to make a commitment to, one, smile and be kind and gentle with us, two, lead, lead by example showing the life of Christian in your behaviors to others, three, share good news of Jesus with the children you meet in the hallway of the church, in the aisle of the grocery stores, and in the streets. Children need to know that we belong to a God who sent his only son so that we might know we are loved and we might be forgiven for the wrong cho choices we make. Yeah. Is Lebanon Church willing to reach out to families and provide support through parenting classes and weekday programs? Are we as children an important part of your church? Do you welcome us as Jesus did, or are you ready to turn us away with a harsh word or look? Remember, you represent Jesus to the children who worship with us. We cannot rely on the culture which we live to impart the Christian faith to our children. It's not going to happen. There's too many young people out there who are suffering because parents and friends left it to someone else to tell them about God and how God wants them to live their lives. Faith is not something we can give to our children in a neat little package. Rather, faith is a journey we take together. We as children need your guidance, and you need our openness to the love of God. <laughs> this is a joyful responsibility to help children know the Bible, not only as the book we read and worship, but also as the story of people who loved God and tried to follow God's will. The Bible is our family album, the record of the family of God. Our guidebook to show us how God wants us to live. We need to be creative, rec recognizing that Sabbath school is not the only time Christian education takes place. Consider offering weekday programs for children at fel and fellowship programs for elementary age children. Children have a strong sense of fairness. How many times have you heard the words, but that's not fair? Often adults respond to children with the phrase, life's not fair. That's not really enough. By engaging children in worship and in a real relationship with God, we can help bring some fairness to their world. As children today learn about justice and forgiveness in the local churches, they can in turn 
offer that same justice and forgiveness to the world. The Christian can min the church can minister boldly through our Christian education program. Make sure that worship is a part of all you do. Yes. Many of the children in our congregations, and probably some of their parents, think think worship is that boring time we spend in church on Saturday morning. I tell you the mom who was telling a little girl with her own child who was like, she said, you used to skate outside in the pond. I had a swing made from a tire. It hung from a tree in our backyard. We went horseback riding. We had so much fun. The little girl looked at her, ma looked at her mom with wide-eyed amazement and said, gee, I wish that I knew when you did those things. Have you, the adults, forgotten how to have fun? Have you forgotten that you two were once kids and need to have the excitement that Jesus has brought to life for you? You have a chance to bring life to worship for your children yes. and to help them understand that we can worship under the tree in the backyard. We can worship as we serve others, and we can worship in the everyday things we do and have fun in the Lord, doing all these things. As we look to the future, we have to seek ways to help the children in our congregations and communities develop a relationship with God that is real, personal and real. Ellen White helps us with what Jesus was getting at when he said, you must become like little children. The simplicity, the self-forgetfulness, and the confiding love of a little ch child are the attributes that heaven values. These are the characteristics of real great greatness. Sometimes it takes adults a long while to get this message of Jesus. Even adults who have kids, you tend to be, tend to be concerned with if they will turn out right or that we cannot learn what you have to teach us. One thing about small children, you can know exactly what we mean. You can take our words at face value. As people get older, their words get laid with all so sorts of hints and hidden meanings. But not kids. We say what we mean. A grandmother was walking on the beach with her two little granddaughters, picking up shells and putting them in a bucket. Some of the shells had pretty patterns. One of the girls was cooling over patterns saying, Grandma, they are beautiful. Then she found a pattern shell, but it was broken. What a shame, said Grandma. It's broken. Yes, the little girl said, but it's still beautiful. What a lesson of grace. Broken, but still beautiful? That's the wisdom of children, and it's the wisdom that Jesus tells us we must have to enter the kingdom of heaven. Our application from the master is, whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. Does this church welcome children? Do we value them, not for what they may become, but value them right now for themselves? Jesus' way was 100% opposite. No wonder many of... No wonder many Adventist young people walk away from the church and never come back. They grew up seeing stern-looking, unsmiling adults in church who, who were impatient with them and seemed to ever be finding fault. Hardly anyone took the time to learn their need or talk to them on a level that they could appreciate. Here's a suggestion. Let's resolve that we will learn the names of every child in this congregation and that we will greet them by the name each Sabbath and spend a moment chatting with them. Why not go out of your way to commend them, to let them know that they are special to Lebanon and to our God? During this New Year's, look at ways to invite families to grow in faith together. Consider having a Bible study centered on people who are led by God. Moses, Abraham, David, Ruth, Peter, Paul, and Mary. This is a new day. A day in which we can tell the stories of the Bible. A day in which children are welcome in worship. Not just to listen, but to also lead out. A day when the church takes ser seriously the need to support families as they seek to raise their children in Christian homes and in a, in, in a on Christian environment. Saying yes to kids means that children don't have to be in crisis to merit our help. It means we're going to provide an environment where children can grow spiritually and physically healthy. As we plan for worship and educational experiences in coming years, let's be sure we're including children in our planet. 
let's be in ministry with children, not for the children. We may do some things with children only, or we may do some things with adults only, but we really need to plan some of the events with an intergenerational experience so that children will experience being part of the family of God. The old story of God and his love for all people can be fresh and alive for each one of us today. Children are hungering to know about God and Jesus. We have only to reach out and share with all God's children. In every group of kids, there's someone who doesn't fit. It's as though someone has to be singled out as the slowest or the fattest or the dumbest. The sad thing is that no matter how these designations rise, they become self-fulfilling prophecies. So in the midst of a crowd, you have kids who don't belong, who have a low self-image, and who are desperately lonely. We should do what Jesus would do if he were here. We should look out for the left out ones, the lonely ones, the cast off and give them special attention, helping to build up their self-esteem to get them accepted by others. In early 2001, FBI agent Robert Hansen was arrested one Sunday morning just after he had left the satchel materials to be picked up by his Russian contacts. When the extent of his activities became known, he delivered vast amounts of top secret information, leading to the exposure and execution of at least two Russian spies. Here was a, was a man seemingly devoted to church, family, and country who attended mass every Sunday and was a member of the tightly knit Catholic lay organization Opus Dei. How could this individual become the most dangerous double agent in the FBI's 90-year history? The Washington, the Washington Post decided to figure out what made Robinson Hunter tick. After a long investigation, they concluded that the root of Henderson's betrayal lay in the bad relationship between Robert and his father, Howard. They listed a, pat, a pattern of verbal and physical abuse by the father, for whom the son could never do anything well enough to please him. For instance, when Robert took his chest to get his driver's license, he was failed. Even though he drove well, later he found out that his father had paid the structure to fare him. So that in, how, in his father's view, Robert wouldn't be so confident. That was the pattern. In college, Howard told one of Robert's professors that his son's grades were sure to go down. And on the night before Robert's wedding, Howard tried to dissuade his fiance from going ahead with the marriage. Young minds, how sensitive they are. Who's sufficient to guide the twigs so that I would grow straight? Who is sufficient for this precious but all important work? Who is sufficient to be a parent? Who is sufficient to be a guide to the church's children? None of us is sufficient, but Jesus, he is our sufficiency. We must spend much time in prayer. We must contemplate his life, and in particular, how he dealt with children as we spend time with him. He will transform us into his likeness. His attitude will become our attitude. His ways, our ways. Then, then like him, him, we will be, be ready, ready to be shepherds, shepherds of, of the lambs. lambs.